you open in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, it's a fitting thing to begin where God began as we speak on the blessed subject of mothers. And again, I repeat to you that mothers are quite a precious commodity. All of us do owe our existence to them. Genesis 2.18 is quite an interesting passage. As we begin there, just briefly noting where mothers come from, we are going to look at a most precious, precious subject. But the scriptures teach us in verse 18 of Genesis 2 that the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. What's interesting is this is the very first thing in creation that was not good. Everything else that God did in the majesty of spinning the stars into place, of setting the galaxies in motion, when he got all done, he looked at his creation and he said, it is not good yet. Now, there are actually two ways that we could look at that. The woman's view is God saw man and immediately thought he could do better, so he made the woman. That's one way to look at it. Uh, then, of course, there's the man's view, which is God made the universe and rested. And then he made the woman. And you all know the rest, right? And no one has rested since. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that God said, let's go to the origin, let's go to the beginning of my creation and show to you what my purposes are. And the scriptures say, verse 23, the man was speaking and after God had created from him woman, and that's what woman means, out of the man, woe man. It says, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And woman and women and mothers find their existence as that which has proceeded in the divine, perfect creation of God, out of man to be that which is the completion of man. And what's so beautiful about this is the very last part of verse 18, it says that woman is a helper, literally, literally corresponding or suitable to man. And we're going to see that. But now look at chapter 3, verse 15. And we're going to see the beginning of mothers of the promise. Mothers who have a special, special calling of God throughout ancient times up to the time of our Lord and beyond. Genesis 3.15, again, is the Lord God speaking. He's speaking to a literal serpent, which was an embodiment of the very literal devil, Satan, that great angel that was the covering angel of the throne of God who had a rebellion and in pride stormed out of heaven and took a third of the heavenly host with him. And that's who we know as Satan or Lucifer. And he came down to the garden one day and tempted man and drew first woman and then man into sin. And God was speaking about the judgment to come. And in the midst of that judgment, verse 15, we have one of the grandest promises for mankind. Look at verse 15, God speaking, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Something very interesting about that. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. What's very interesting is, and I, I want to share with you, that God said that a woman and that mothers were going to have a specific ministry from this 15th verse of chapter 3 onward. Did you catch all the elements? First of all, that there's a supernatural birth coming. Look at verse 15 there where it says, in between your seed, that's the serpent's seed, that's the children of unrighteousness and her seed. Did you know women do not have seed? Biblically speaking, medically speaking, that it's the man that bears the seed and the woman that conceives and gives birth to the child. This is the first mention of the supernatural birth that was coming. A rare, a unique, a once in all time thing of a woman conceiving without a man. This is the virgin birth being spoken of far before, centuries before it took place. And so the woman was going to have her seed, and she was going to have a child. And there is no man mentioned. And as we know from the scriptures, Isaiah and Matthew and Luke, that this was what we call the virgin birth. But secondly, look at the nature of this one that's coming. Verse 15 again. Between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head. 
the woman's seed coming, he shall bruise you. And who is God talking to at that time? The serpent, Satan, Lucifer. He, this promised seed that's going to come supernaturally, miraculously, is going to bruise you, Satan, on the head. Now, you know that is a crushing death blow. To the head is far more serious than to the, and look at the next phrase there, you shall bruise him, that's the coming seed, on his heel. So here's the picture. Here is a picture of a coming supernatural one who is going to crush the serpent. And while he's crushing the serpent, the serpent gives him a token on his heel. So there's two things, a supernatural birth coming and a supernatural conqueror coming. And what's amazing is from this point onward in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, with this first promise, there began to be a line of mothers of the promise. Mothers who in succession were those who God had chosen to be in the line for two things. To bring Christ into this world and to portray God's grace. This very promise came at the beginning of the curse upon man. Well, turn to Matthew 1. And this is where we're going to spend our time this morning with a few diversions. Because in Matthew 1, we get a beautiful listing of this group of people that were in this line awaiting the coming of the promised one. Now, I know this is a passage often used at Christmas and then forgotten. I think it's time to remind ourselves. Let's look at those that were in the family tree of this supernatural conqueror and of this one that was to be known as the Messiah. Who did God pick to put in that list? Well, if you look at Matthew 1, and this is the part that everyone skips over when they start reading the Bible, right? You just zip right through it. I'll just share with you that there are 46 specifically named people in this passage until we come to Christ's name. He's the 47th. There are 41 men, but you know what else there are? Five marvelous mothers. And there's something that we need to see in these mothers of the promise about God's marvelous picking, choosing, and bringing them in. These were those that were in the line that brought from the Garden of Eden and from that place where the death knell of humanity had sounded with fallen man and God cursing man and saying, death was upon all, separation from my presence. These were in that line that were bringing hope to the world. These were those who would bring a ray of light, the ones that would bring the promised conqueror, the ones that would ultimately be bringing forth this supernatural birth. These ladies in this line were the ones that soon were to herald the sunrise on the night of sin that came into our world because a Savior was going to be born. And to be in that line was the realization of God's greatest promise, to man in the fall, that someday a woman was going to bear seed in a supernatural way that defied normal workings. And when that woman did bear that child, that child supernaturally conceived was going to be the conqueror of the curse. Well, Matthew 1 1 starts out, and let's meet these folks, because the first thing we see is that they're women in a man's world. And they start off almost on a bad foot because in the ancient world, women were not highly thought of. In fact, even in the modern world, they are still struggling for recognition and for rising in this world. But it was far worse in the ancient world. And if you look at this, it was so common, this genealogy. 41 men. In fact, if you look at Luke's parallel account, and you don't have to in Luke chapter 3, you find they're all men. No women are listed. But God wanted to give us a marvelous portrait of his mothers of the promise as he included for us here these five women. Let's meet them briefly. First of all, verse 3, do you see the first one? It says, Tamar. And to Judah were born Perez and Zerah by Tamar. That's his wife. Verse 5. We find two more of the ladies. And to Salmon was born Boaz by Rahab. And to Boaz was born Obed by Ruth. And to Obed, Jesse. And 
verse 6, to Jesse was born David the king. But I went right over, did you see, to Obed by Ruth in verse 5. We have two in verse 5, Rahab and Ruth. And then look in verse 6, the second half of it there. And to David was born Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Who's that? Bathsheba. And then the final woman to be listed is in verse 16, and we know her quite well. And to Jacob was born Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Five women. You can note that in all the other lists, they are not named. This is highly unusual. But also, number two, not only are they women, and that's unusual in a man's world, but they're not just normal women. Each of them are women with a mark. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, look back at them. Let me tell you just briefly about each one of these ladies. Look at verse 3. And to Judah was born Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Did you know that Tamar was Judah's daughter? How was Judah having children by his daughter? And when we think of Tamar, what do we think of? We think of one word, incest. Grievous, gross though it might be, we think of Tamar and incest. Secondly, look at Rahab in verse 5. When we think of Rahab, what is synonymous with Rahab? It's right from the book of James. Rahab the harlot, of course, harlotry. How about Ruth? Also in verse 5, when we think about Ruth, we think about a woman from a cursed, incestuously conceived nation called Moab. And you all know the story about that in Genesis 19. As God was able to save Lot and his family out of Sodom, but God could not take Sodom out of his family. And it wasn't long before they were involved in sin. And this nation was conceived again a father with his daughter and all the wickedness and the brutal nature of that sin. Bathsheba, look at verse 6. When we think of Bathsheba, the movies have even portrayed this. Bathsheba is synonymous with one word, adultery. And that's what hangs over her name, even as we see her in this list. And finally, Mary, in verse 16. Mary, virtuous to us, but we weren't living in the first century. When I think of Mary, I think of a woman that was haunted for 33 and one half years with a shadow that hung over her. And that shadow was people whispering and saying, illegitimate fornication. Not a proper type of thing went on in her life. Well, let's get to the central issue here. And I want you to to put all this together as I jump into this list here and, and talk about mothers of the promise. Number one, God chose a plan to save fallen humanity. Now, there's a lot of plans he could have chosen. He could have chosen to marshal all the forces of the universe and bring them down and surround the earth and make everybody petrified and fall down before him. He could have sent all kinds of fiery hosts from heaven. He could have come down in burning glory. But he chose a plan. And his plan was to invade and conquer this earth back personally. And he said, I'm going to come, and I'm going to come to this earth, and I'm going to come in the most humble and the most quiet little way I can come. I'm going to come down and become one of them. And I'm going to invade this earth. And the medium he came was the supernatural birth through a woman. We all know this. But as we look at this list, we find that the ones he chose were women, and if that wasn't bad enough because of the lowly view of women in the ancient world, they were women with a mark. They were women that were each one stained some way, either by their own sin, the sins of another, or the scandalous thoughts of others. But also there's a third thing about each of these women. As you look at this list, as, as you think about them, if you think about Tamar, Ruth, Rahab, Bathsheba, and Mary, do you know what else is amazing about them? Not only are they women, not only are they women who are marked with some kind of stain in their lives, but the third thing is they're unqualified, most of them. Do you know why? Jesus Christ was to be a Jew, and he was. Did you know that at least three, if not four, of these women aren't even Jews? God reached outside of the covenant people. Mary was a Jew. Possibly Tamar was a Jew. 
Bathsheba was a Hittite. Ruth was a Moabite. Rahab was a Canaanite. All of them were condemned outside the covenant people. There's only one word that describes what God did in this whole process, and that word is grace. And when we talk about mothers of the promise and when we look deeply into their lives in the next few moments this morning, we're looking at two things. We're looking at women that were marked and God picked them to be those that would bring Christ into this world and God picked them to be beautiful portraits of grace. So what do we have? Five women, tainted by sin or suspicion, barely qualified, at least three out of five don't meet the requirements, all part of a grand and glorious plan. I'd like to introduce you to women who were mothers of the promise to bring Christ and to portray grace. Let's meet them each personally. Look at verse 3 again, and if you're taking notes, I'll give you a few lines so that you can look up some of these women at a later time on your own. First of all, Tamar. And when I introduce you to Tamar and and her chapter that introduces her to us in the scripture is Genesis 38, I would like to introduce you to a woman who we might call defrauded. And that's a word I want you to always remember when you think of Tamar. Think of a woman defrauded. You say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, first of all, God had to kill her husband because he was a wicked sinner, a rebellious man, And God went right down and reached down, and personally, it's not very often he does this, they stand out in history, and he personally struck him dead because he did not like what he did. Number two, in spite of that grief in Genesis 38, not only was she a widow because God had directly killed her husband, but she was forgotten, she was lied to, she was overlooked, and she finally takes the law into her own hands. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, you know what happened. One of Judah's sons had married her. She had become a widow. Judah promised he would get her a new husband. Her father-in-law said, I'll get you a new husband. So she goes back home, puts on her widow's raiment, and waits, and waits. And she finds that Judah has taken care of everything else except for her. And so the scripture tells us that she takes matters into her own hands. God never condones her sin. He just describes it. So she goes, she sits, she poses as a harlot. She has a child out of wedlock through having an incestuous affair with her own father-in-law. In In all this, she was defrauded. She was defrauded of a normal life. By no means did she have any type of a normal life. She was defrauded out of a happy marriage. She didn't have a happy marriage. She picked someone or was chosen, and she wanted to spend her life with him, and God struck him down. She was defrauded out of a good name. People said, that's the woman that God had to judge her husband. That's the woman that got involved with her father-in-law. She was defrauded out of having a sterling reputation. She was robbed of all these things by one little thing called sin. And so we see a woman that is living 38 centuries ago, a woman that is defrauded, She's been defrauded by losing her husband. She's been defrauded by being overlooked by her father. She's been defrauded by allowing sin to make her take matters into her own hands. She's been defrauded as she has this illicit union. But in spite of all that, God graciously places her here as a mother of the promise. Why? Why? Well, do you know anyone like this? Do you know anybody that's been cheated out of a normal life, out of a happy marriage, out of a good name, out of having a good reputation because of sin? Just as 38 centuries ago, God looked down at this woman who was a sinner, and he said, you know what, I have a plan for you. In spite of your sin, which you are responsible for, in spite of your sin, which you are guilty for, I will forgive you. And God brought her in. And Matthew 1, 3 says, And to Judah were born two sons, Perez and Zerah. And as if to elevate her for all time, not as glorifying her sin, but marvelously glorifying her Savior, 
God said, there is a mother of the promise. There is a woman who portrays God's plan. A wicked sinner forgiven. A wicked sinner that is allowed to be part of the line that would bring the Redeemer to humanity to bring Christ. One who portrays God's grace. Look at verse 5, number 2. And if we were to introduce Rahab with one word, we would call her a woman defiled. No better word would describe this woman than a woman who is defiled. Write down in your notes if you want to read about her, Joshua chapter 2. Because in Joshua chapter 2, we find a woman who was a businesswoman in the ancient world. We're now 35 centuries before Christ, 1400 46 B.C., children of Israel marched out of Egypt. 1406 B.C., they face the walls of Jericho. On those walls was a woman, a very smart businesswoman. She was in two businesses, two of the most ancient of all businesses. Number one, she was an innkeeper. Number two, which in the ancient world almost always went together, she was a woman of harlotry. Not only did she give people lodging, but she also gave them a sinful substitute for what God ordained in marriage. And so this woman we meet was a harlot. She was sitting on a wall that God was going to destroy. She was in a city that God had doomed and said he was going to completely decimate the population there. She was on a race, the Canaanites, that God had personally declared harem. He was going to exterminate them. She was in every sense a defiled woman. She was a sexual sinner. She was in a cursed race. She was a doomed city dweller. And literally, she was sitting on a bomb because God was going to destroy where she was. And so when we meet her in Joshua 2, we find a woman in every sense, morally, ethnically, in her everyday life, even in her future status, a woman who was defiled with terminal defilement. Her destruction was looming. And I wonder, you ever, have you ever met anyone like that? I have. I think that's one of the most beautiful pictures of lost people. Rahab was part of a doomed race. Did you know the human race is doomed? Every one of us have a terminal illness. Some people know the name of it. The rest of us don't know what's going to get us, but it's going to get us sooner or later. We're all terminally ill. We're all going to die. The germ we have is called sin, and no one gave it to us. We received it by inheritance from our forefather, Adam. We've fallen into sin. We're all in a world that God is going to destroy. All of us are guilty of sin. All of us are facing his judgment. And so that day, in Joshua 2, God reached down and plucked her with her family out of the inferno of his destruction on Jericho and plops her graciously right here into verse 5. And to Salmon was born Boaz by Rahab. And God reached down and he said, I'm going to destroy every living thing in that city except for that little tiny section of the wall. And at the top of the wall was a little inn. And the top of the inn were huddled. Can you imagine what it would have been like that day? to have those spies say, stay inside your house and put a little red cord out your window and to stay inside your house and to look and to see 300-foot-high walls just crumble and fall around you and your walls stayed standing. And to see that army come marching in, slicing and demolishing every living thing and to look and to see every single person in your city destroyed and every animal and to see the whole thing in a conflagration of burning and to be spared. What a portrait of salvation and how the word glows in her case. Graciously chosen, God graciously put this defiled woman right here in verse 5 as a mother of the promise, a mother that would bring Christ and portray God's grace. Look at the other lady in her verse, verse 5. Ruth, there's a whole book about Ruth. If you want to know about Ruth, Ruth was a Moabite. If you want to know where Moabites came from, you can look in Genesis 19. Her distant forefather had sired her race in the midst of a drunken orgy with his own daughters. 
You know, God doesn't, he doesn't cut any of the facts when they're necessary to look at. God had always, in Scripture, condemned drunkenness. And he condemned all the evils of that. And his unscrupulous daughters brought Lot to a state of drunkenness and produced a tribe of people that would face God's judgment, known as the Moabites. Well, a lot of time went by. In Deuteronomy 23, these people that God had cursed because of their wicked origins, God had protected until we get to Deuteronomy 23. And Deuteronomy 23 was written just before Rahab and, and Jericho were meeting. And in Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 and 4, God said, No Moabite could enter God's assembly for ten generations. Do you know why? Because they were from such a defiled and despised race. And that's why this morning we can call Tamar defrauded. We can call Rahab defiled. But when we meet Ruth, we can call Ruth despised. She was despised by the Jewish people, though she personally had done nothing to deserve it. She is in the wrong race. She was out of the wrong family. Think about this. She was tainted by the past. She hadn't done anything wrong. She was hounded by someone else's sin. She was scarred by a family scandal, not her own. She was plagued by the darkness of a stain. And as you read in the book of Ruth, after a short and sad marriage, her husband dies, the famine is all about them, and God writes one of the sweetest Old Testament stories of grace that have ever been written in the book of Ruth. What does he write? He writes that God reaches down and takes a woman from a cursed race, from a despised people, and he takes her and he says, you come into my family. And a man named Boaz takes her to be his wife. And she then, upon that marriage, becomes a mother of God's promise. She became one through whom Christ would come and very gloriously one through whom God would portray his grace. The fourth mother Look down there in verse 6 is Bathsheba, and let's hurry along. We meet her in 2 Samuel chapters 10 and 11. And basically, Bathsheba would be a woman that we would call defeated because Bathsheba was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And you know the story. She was unwise at best. She was immodest in her display. She then, after noting the King David's interest in her, listens to him. She muffles the warnings from her heart as God's conviction was upon her. She stifles those virtuous vows that she had made. She ignores the fact that God had given her a wonderful husband. And she throws herself to the passion and sin that would follow. And what's so amazing about this is she thought that, and he thought that they could hide it. How often does that happen? People think, oh, I can do this and no one will ever find out. Oh, we will cover our tracks. But the scriptures say, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you'll reap. And what you whisper will be shouted from the rooftop. And her sin becomes monumental. In fact, movies today are made about it. David and Bathsheba for all the sinful romance that the world sees in that. It's public and it's shameful and it's sin. What's the result of that defeat she went through? Her husband lies in a pool of blood at the foot of a wall, murdered. The little baby that was conceived chokes out its life into death in great grief as Bathsheba, the grieving, sorrowing mother, as David, the murderous, adulterous suitor, are in great sadness. And all the world, when Nathan comes, knows forever that she was defeated. What does God do? God graciously lifts her. And we find in verse 6, and David, and to David was born Solomon. And between those two men, we have a great deal of our scripture. Through those two men, we learn about what it means to have wise living, to be a man after God's own heart. 
but to David was born Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. What is God saying? God's saying, here's a woman I'm going to portray my grace upon. Here's a woman that is unworthy. Here's a woman who is a sinner. Here's a woman who did many things wrong, but I'm going to take her. And I'm going to let her bring one that will bring Christ into this world, and I'll let her be a portrait of grace. Let's conclude with verse 16 of Matthew 1. The last woman, we can call her determined. And what's interesting about Mary is we know a whole lot about her that's not true, and we know very little about her that the Bible talks about. What we know about her that's not true is all the stuff that's, that's in the white spaces in the Bible here. In fact, books and books have been written about Mary, and none of it's in the Bible. What is in the Bible? Well, here's very quickly what's in the Scripture. Mary was born a normal sinner. There's nothing in the Bible that says Mary was anything else than just like you and me. She was a very normal sinner. She comes to faith in the true God. She quotes from the Old Testament and talks about the fact that God lifted her up out of the ash heap, out of the dung hill, and she looked on God as her Savior. Now, rather than listening to a bunch of writers, let's listen to her own words in the Word of God. As she acknowledges her lostness, as she comes to faith in God and becomes a quiet, determined woman who wants to know God's Word and obey it. What does she do? Well, she falls in love, which is very noble. She meets an angel, which is very notable. She receives a commission, which was very, very unusual. And she supernaturally conceives a child while engaged to her husband. Well, her fiancé plans to dump her. The only reason he did that was Joseph was so gracious she should have been stoned because he thought she had been in fornication. People scorn her. She bears public shame for one-third of a century. Can you imagine that? Living for a third of a century through the entire life and ministry of Christ, and everywhere you go, there's your son speaking, and there's a bunch of women whispering and saying, yes, and do you know where that boy came from? Some Roman soldier somewhere. And they were scorning her. She's a falsely accused by the people. She even has to be put in her place by the Lord Jesus Christ at one time. And she is continually saddened because her own children did not believe what she believed about God's promise of Christ coming. But through it all, God graciously reached down and made her the mother of the promise. She bore Christ. She partook of grace. She said, oh God, my Savior, as Luke puts it. And she became the one, ultimately, through whom the promise arrived. Let's pull all this together and conclude this morning. None of these five women deserved this privilege to be a mother of the promise. None of them deserved for God to use them. All of them were sinners. Tamar was defrauded. Rahab was defiled by her lifestyle. Ruth was despised because of her family. Bathsheba was defeated because she made choices she shouldn't have made. Mary was determined, in spite of the fact of the scorn upon her, in spite of the fact that she was blessed of all women, that she would obey God. I just want to ask you two questions this morning. Do you see anyone you know? Do you know anybody this morning that's defrauded, that because of a series of events that maybe they were a part of or maybe they weren't, their lives are marked? Do you know anyone, a mother, a woman, a person that you know that's defiled? That sin has wrenched the blessedness of purity out of their life? Do you know anyone that's despised? Maybe because of their race? Maybe because of their social standing? Maybe because of the fact they bear some scar or some, some scandal upon them? Do you know anyone that's defeated? that they just walked too close to the fire of passion, too close to the line, and they were swept into sin. And yes, they've borne the grief of it, and yes, they've borne the scars of it. Do you know someone that's defeated? Then I wonder, will you determine, as these women did, and as each of them was, that you, as a mother this morning, will be a mother of the promise? You say, what's that? What's that? 
Well, every child you bear into this world, mothers, are marked by sin. All of them are already defiled. Already, they have each been defrauded out of their inheritance God wanted to give them because they're sinners. Every one of them are despised. Every one of them are defeated at birth by sin. And today, you are a mother of the promise that can point them to Christ and can be a portrait of God's grace to them. That's the highest calling that anybody could have. And you know, this morning, you might not be a mother. You might just be a normal man, a normal woman, a normal child. I wonder today, in your life, have you been defiled by sin? Have you been defeated, defrauded, despised? Will you determine today that you will partake of the promise. That you will trust in God, your Savior, to wash away that sin as far as the east is from the west so that he can look upon you in the righteousness of Christ. There's a glorious message from God's word. And that message is this, that God has graciously chosen a line of women to bring Christ into the world, those women who were destined to be mothers of the promise, and each of them is a beautiful portrait of God's grace. For all who come to Christ come as lowly sinners, undeserving, graciously chosen by him. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, I thank you for giving to us in your word this beautiful portrait of these five mothers that you picked to be those who would stand in this succession of generations to bring forth your promised one. On this day, we honor mothers, but on this day, we stand with your word, saying there's even a greater honor than merely having children. It's to have children and to be a mother of the promise that brings Christ into their lives, that portrays grace. And, O oh Christ, since you have come into this world, all who will determine that they will turn from their sin and by faith receive you can be a partaker of the promise today. Though defiled, though defeated, partaking graciously of your forgiveness. Thank you this morning for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.